let's get going. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to cloudy but fun-filled morning of chemistry with your host, Dr. White, Chem 1105. And a uh, couple important things. One, don't forget, turn in your labs. If you don't, you get zero points. And that's 10 points a lab. That could be the difference between A and B, B and C or D and uh, C or D and F. It can make 10 points. If you do two labs, 20 points is not going to help your grade. So make sure you turn in your labs. Now, next, yes, we do, Rain, the one we did on Tuesday. Every lab day, we have the previous lab do. No problem. Remember, everyone, there's no such thing as a dumb question in my universe, especially in my class. So always feel free to ask questions, always. And you never have to say you're sorry when you ask a question. All right. Now, another thing I want to mention is a week from today will be test two. Test two is harder than test one. Relax, students do good, uh, have done if they study. How do you study? Do the practice problems. On Monday, I will go through chapter five, part one, practice problems. And I would hope you all do those before I do. That will help you do better on test two. And test two, I didn't have a chance last night, but sometime today or tomorrow, I will post uh, information about test two. It's gonna be next Thursday after lab from roughly 10 to 11.30, just like we did test one. I'll send a post in the assignment area, a password protected PDF file, and then on Thursday morning at about 10, I'll email you the password for your version of the PDF file. I have two versions. I can test one. I had A and C. I don't know. I'll pick two other letters of the alphabet. And you'll have an hour and a half to take the test and upload it. Uh, I wrote it, but I forgot how many pages there are how many problems. I don't think I have any multiple choice on test number two. And are you ready for this? There's five, five, five bonus points. And unlike other instructors who take, give a test and at the very end, put a very hard bonus problem, I don't do that. I just have the whole test add up to 105. So it'll be five bonus points. And I just remembered I forgot something. Hold on, I gotta get something real quick. I'm back. I forgot to put this on. Bad Dr. White. My college ring. I've been faithfully wearing this for a long, long time. And anyways, so that will be test number two. Test number two will cover chapter four and chapter five, part one. And we will, within the next 30 minutes, have covered all the material that will be on test two, which is in keeping. I try and finish early. That gives you a couple of days to do practice problems. So you'll do good on that. Any questions about test number two? Like I said, later today or tomorrow morning, I will post and you'll get an email of how many pages and all that. Like all my tests, if you study, 
normally I say take about in a face to face we'd have 50 minutes I say take about an hour you go five minutes over that's okay uh, but anyways you have plenty of time if you study in a face to face test number two most students are done 40 45 minutes uh, with test number two and I give them 50 55 minutes so you have plenty of time if you study and also I'd also recommend strongly that you look at test number two important information in the folder uh, lecture folder of blackboard because those are things you don't have to memorize you do have to know how to use them but you don't have to memorize them in the past i did all right any questions about that well in that case let's get going Now, yesterday, I went through examples of what I call mass calculations for a reaction. And I'll do an example. And there are three steps for this type of problem. The first step is whatever you're given in grams, the mass of A, you convert to moles of A. Next, whatever you're the moles of A you've just calculated, you convert to moles of B, which is the answer you're trying to get in grams, but first you have to do two moles of B. And finally, once you get moles of B, you convert it to grams of B, which we've done one and three, we've practiced a number of times. And yesterday we worked also on step two separately. And then with this, we also work where you put this all together. What you see on the screen, steps one, two, and three will be given to you in important information, test number two. All right. Let's do a problem a little different than the one we did yesterday, but the same problem solving process. I think this is similar to what I did yesterday. So, um, now let's do this one. We'll do another one. All right. First of all, thumbs up, people. Do you see the problem on your way, on your screen now? Ten points. Thank you. All right. Let's go through it. You're given this balanced chemical equation. And you're asked how many grams of sodium chloride will you make if you react 48.67 grams of chlorine with an excess of sodium. Now what I'd like you to do is right here, put determine what are you being asked to find? What are you given?
Okay, everybody done? I hope so. Hold on. I see a question. I see someone answering it. All right, what are you being asked to find? Grams of sodium chloride. What are you given? 48.67 grams of chlorine gas, Cl2. And you're also given excess of sodium, which means you ignore it. You're also given the balanced chemical equation. As soon as you see this hint, this might be a hint too, you know you need three steps. And step one in the important information, step one is mass of A to moles of A. And what does that mean? Whatever you're given in grams, and that's chlorine, you want to convert to moles of chlorine. And therefore, how do you do that? You say, well, I only have this, so I better start with that. If I had some ratio, what would I want my answer to be? Moles of chlorine. And now it's time to use your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis, Whatever you're trying to get to goes on top of this ratio. Whatever you're trying to get rid of goes underneath. And where do I get these numbers? Hold on while I open something that I should have opened up. All right, everybody see important information on your screen now? Thumbs up, people. All right, thank you. And how do you get a, the relationship of a mole of a compound to grams of a compound? By the molecular weight. So one mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that compound in grams. So what we need here is one mole of a compound. And right here, we have to do the molecular weight of chlorine. And the molecular weight of any compound is the sum of the atomic weights. There's two chlorine. What's the atomic weight of chlorine? All right, on the periodic table, all of you seeing should see right now. Thumbs up, people. Do you see it? Uh, right here is chlorine. And underneath is the atomic weight. And the atomic weight on the periodic table I will give you, or you download, is 35.453. And you have to round that off the three significant figures. Why? Because on test number two instructions, underneath your name, it will say, please use proper significant figures for all calculated answers. 
and it'll also now say, please use all atomic weights, the three significant figures. I'll give you three seconds to round that off to three significant figures. Go. I'll give you some bonus time. Uh, time's up. Keep the three, keep the five, keep the four. Use the five after the four to round off. Is that five or higher? Yes. So you drop the five, drop the three, increase the four by one. So to three significant figures, the atomic weight of chlorine is 35.5. And the Molecular weight of chlorine gas, Cl2, is 2 times 35.5, uh, which is 71.0. So here I put in 71.0. Now, something I didn't do yesterday that I should have, and I'm going to do today, is the following. As soon as I maximize this, all right. Now, let's let me write down these numbers so I because I'm going to forget them as I run the make these on the fly. And before I pick up my calculator, I forgot to do, notice grams of chlorine divided by grams of chlorine equals one, because anything divided by itself equals one. And I'm going to get the right units for step one. And now I'll go to my calculator. And for this, the reason I'm going to spreadsheet, which I didn't do yesterday, is I want to show you something I will be doing on test number two for this type of problem. Now, does everybody see the spreadsheet on your screen right now? Thank you. All right. Now, in column G, that's what my calculator gave me. Now, I'm going to round off at each person. I'm going to round that off to three significant figures. And that's the number. Forget about the zeros because I have it formatted the cells. That would be 0 0.685. Now, column G and H, and I might go into I, column G, I'll round off at the very end. And H, I'll round off at each step. But at this point, we now know we have Did I put the number incorrectly. Hold on one sec. Yep, I did. We now know we have 0 0.685 moles of chlorine. And now we have to go to step two because there are three steps. And step two, when you do this on your own, it's faster because you don't have, I'm going very slowly and showing all the details. We want to go from moles of A, whatever we just calculated, to moles of B, where B is what we're trying to get to. And in this case, that would be sodium chloride. So what we really have to do now 
for this problem, moles of chlorine to moles of sodium chloride. And how do we do that? Well, the only number we have is this one we just calculated. So I'm going to start there. And once again, we'll use our good buddy, our good friend, unit analysis. <laughs> Love that whistle. Unfortunately, the company that makes it is out of business, a West German company for many years, but I got three in my house and they never leave my house. Anyways, we have moles of chlorine. We're trying to go to moles of sodium chloride. And time to use your good buddy, your good friend, your analysis, whatever we're trying to get to goes on top. The units, whatever units we're trying to get rid of, we put at the bottom of this ratio. And on top goes moles, sodium chloride. Under here goes moles of chlorine gas. And where do we get the ratio moles of sodium chloride to moles of chlorine. And remember, the coefficients of a balanced chemical equation represent molar quantities. The coefficients of a balanced chemical equation, molar quantities, or you can also say molar ratios. I use both. And what does that mean? If we look up here, we have two moles of sodium. When there's no number in front, the coefficient, it's one. React with one mole of chlorine to make two moles of sodium chloride. So for every one mole of chlorine, we make two moles of sodium chloride. And the molar ratios, like I said, two moles of sodium, one mole of chlorine make two moles of sodium chloride. So for every one mole of chlorine, we make two moles of sodium chloride. Now these are exact numbers. And by the way, I forgot to point up here, this is four significant figures. This is three significant figures, which is why our answer is three significant figures. Because when you do a multiplication division, by the way, the one is an exact number. So it has no role. You, when you do multiplication division, the number that has the fewest significant figures is the number of significant figures your answer should have. And now if we look at this, this has three significant figures. Our answer should have three significant figures because one and two are exact numbers and they don't play a role in determining significant figures. So now I'll go back to my calculator. And notice there's a slight difference in column G. I'm going to round off the very end. Since this is already three significant figures, ignore the zeros. That would be the number in column H. So I now have 1.37 moles of sodium chloride. And this was step two. And now we have to do step number three. And what is that? Moles of B, two grams of B. Why? Because if we look up here, what are we trying to find? 
grams of sodium chloride. Well, in this case, we just calculated moles of sodium chloride, and we're going to convert this to grams of sodium chloride. And how do we do that? Well, we have this number. And we want to go to this grams of sodium chloride. I guess I could have put this over here. And I could have done it in step two also. And again, use your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis, whatever we're trying to get to goes on top. Whatever we're trying to get rid of unit wise goes underneath. Let me write those in. And where do we get a ratio or a somewhere that tells us the relationship of moles of sodium chloride, moles of a compound to grams of a compound? Well, guess what? You're right. Look at important information. One mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that compound in grams. One mole of a compound equals the molecular weight of that compound in grams, and the molecular weight is the sum of all atomic weights of that compound. So now I know I need one mole of sodium chloride equals the molecular weight of sodium chloride, and the molecular weight of sodium chloride is the sum of all atomic weights of the atoms in that, or elements in that compound. Well, if we look at the periodic table, we've already done chlorine. We know that's 35.5, but over here, atomic number seven, 11, what did I say, 11, underneath is the atomic weight of sodium. I'll let you round that off to three significant figures before I do. Time's up. 22.989. How do you round that off to three significant figures? Keep the two, keep the two, keep the nine. Use the eight to round off. That's five or higher. Therefore, I increase to 0.9 by one, which is 1.0 add that to the 22. So to three significant figures, sodium is 23.0. So what we need here is for every one mole, right here, we need the molecular weight of sodium chloride. And the molecular weight of sodium chloride is one sodium, one chlorine. That is equal to one times 23.0 and one times 35.5. And you get that, you get that. I'll add them up, 58.5. When you add up two numbers together, you get the same number of significant figures to the right of the decimal as the number you're adding that has the fewest. This has one, this has one, my answer should have one. So in here, I'll put 58.5. And now before I go any further, I will say, oh, moles of sodium chloride divide moles of sodium chloride. Remember anything divided by itself, A divided, by A is one, cancels out. I'm left with the right units, and now I'm going to go to my calculator.
Now, if you notice, they're different numbers. If I round both of them off to three significant figures in column G, I'll get 80.2. In this one, I'll get 80.1. Which is the right answer on my test? Both. Sometimes both ways you get the same answer. In this case, you don't. I'm a round off at each step, column H. But if you're round off at the end person, you can do G. So the answer to that would be our final answer. You would make either 80.1 or 80.2 grams of sodium chloride. And that's how you do those types of problems. Now, make sure over the weekend you do uh, part uh, chapter five, part one uh, problems. And let me do a quick look. And if you look, I actually have two sets of uh, practice problems of uh, five part one. Let me open both of those up. I don't want to do that. Now, for part one, I have balancing chemical equations. And here's some more practice for you, along with the lab that will be next Tuesday. I'm going to put at least three, maybe four of these types of problems on test two, three points each. So that's nine or 12 points. So you should know how to balance chemical equations. Now, if we look at the problem set part Chapter five, part two. These are the type of problems I just did. And you should know how to do this. And what I'm not finding is somewhere in here. Hold on why look. Was this other part? There are actually three problem sets for chapter five, part one. And this we've already gone through. So you got a lot of work this weekend, but it's summer. So you got between now and Monday, I'm going to go through all three of these. Everybody see on your uh, screen right now? These are things I've already done. And I would recommend you do the balanced chemical equations, then you do mole problems part one from chapter five, part one, then mole problems part two. Do you have to do all of them? No, but if you want to, there's enough to keep you occupied and help you practice. All right, give me a second while I close down a lot of stuff.
All right. Hopefully everybody sees on your screen now percent composition. Thumbs up, people. Thank you. All right. For this slide, click. I've just turned the switch. Will it be on a test or final to the off position? Click. And therefore, let's talk about it, but it will not be on a test. On your screen, you see the formula, what's called percent composition. And when you have a compound, you can find a percent mass, meaning how many, what percent of each element is in a compound like sodium chloride. And you use the following formula, percent mass of each element equals the mass of each element, what's the atomic weight, divided by the molecular weight the molar mass of a compound times 100. Now, this is a formula to determine this. In certain cases, this value, mass percent, or percent mass of each element is important to help identify or prove the structure of molecules, mainly organic. Now, back when I was getting my PhD in a long time ago, back about I hate to say this, but I will. 1977. How many of you were born then? None of you. But anyways, I was finishing up my PhD because I got it in 77, 1977, not 1877. Come on. But anyways, <laughs> uh, in my PhD thesis for my PhD research, I had created or made about 140 new compounds. And for a PhD thesis in organic chemistry, which I am, I had to send out purified samples for each one of those to outside laboratory that does the actual measurements of percent mass for certain elements. And this is called CHNN analysis. And for each one of those, I had to do the percent mass calculation I just showed you. That was in 77. Since then, I have never, ever had to do that because in industry, we really don't do that for new compounds, percent uh, mass or CHNN analysis. We do other things to prove the structure, but that's mainly for academic research, which after I got my PhD, all my research was in industry. Either I managed and they were working on my ideas or when I worked on the bench for about two years. Which is why, guess what? You don't have to know that because I've never used it again, but you do know about it. And I fulfilled my obligation in the active course file. All right. I have covered all the material that will be on test number two. We've already done the problem set for chapter four. And I've just finished all the material on chapter five, part one, that will be on test number two. Later today or tomorrow, I will be putting out an email with that. So guess what time it is? It's new chapter time. And this new chapter will be on test three, not test two. Because I try and finish up and I do a pretty good job. Thank you, Dr. White. You're welcome. Uh, finishing up early so I don't do a day or two before the test. Oh, I'm rushing. And now you've got to practice that. And you're rushing. How do you like that? Uh, anyways, uh, you're all nervous and rushing. No, I don't do that to my students. So let's go to the new chapter. As soon as I open it up.
And that new chapter, chapter six, deals with gases. You know the three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And we're gonna go through so gases now. And I believe the next chapter, we'll talk about liquids. Now, when we talk about gases, there's something called the kinetic molecular theory of gases. And I'm gonna turn, click, the switch is off for these slides. This will not, will not be on test or final, but you still should be aware of it. We talk about a gas, a gas consists of small particles, either atoms or molecules. If you felt the wind on you in the last couple of days, you were feeling molecules of oxygen mainly and nitrogen mainly, mostly, oh, excuse me, nitrogen. And they're moving around zoop, zip, zip, zoop, all around rapidly, very fast. Velocity means speed and direction. Now, because they're moving around so fast, and also they're separated by great distances, the attractive forces between particles of a gas can be neglected. You ignore it. I will. I did. The actual volume occupied by gas <clears throat> is extremely small compared to the volume of the actual gas. So the molecules are spread far apart, which is why you can compress them very easily. Now, the average kinetic energy, we're talking about speed, how fast it's going or how much energy is proportional to its Kelvin, not Fahrenheit, not Celsius, well, you can convert to Kelvin, but in gases, when we're talking about energy and other things, you need to use Kelvin. And gas, uh, gas particles, think of it like billiard balls, for those who know how to play billiards or pool, are in constant motion, they're always moving around, and they're moving in a straight path unless they bump into something like you. So that's the kinetic theory of gases switch was off for that. Now, when we talk about gases, there are certain key properties, and I'll never ask on a test what the key properties are of a gas are, but we're gonna deal with them. One is pressure, which I'll explain in a little while. What is pressure? Another one is volume, how much there is of something, temperature you already know you measure, and amount. And this is usually measured in grams, but you convert it usually to moles, which we just did in the last yesterday and day before, going from grams of a compound to moles of a compound. Do the practice problems for chapter five, part one, you'll practice that. I hope you do. So key properties are pressure, volume, temperature, and amount. Now, for this slide, switches off, but what is pressure? How many of you have ever checked the uh, pressure of your tires of your car? And you either have a gauge or newer cars, they actually have a uh, device in each uh, tire, a sensor, that will give you on your bid dashboard, your pressure, your tires. By the way, you should check them about once a month. But anyways, what's pressure? That's the gas. Yes, there's gas in your tires that keep them inflated so you can drive on them. And what is pressure? Pressure, and this slide is switched off, is the force applied per unit area. And that's the total force on a surface divided by the area of that surface, force per unit area. Now, we don't calculate pressure this way, we measure it with a gauge. And when we measure it, one gauge is a barometer. And a barometer is a device to measure atmosphere pressure. You don't realize it since you were born, it's always been there, but right now, all the gases around you are pushing on you. You don't feel it because you've known it all your life. But right now, those gases are pushing on you. 
And when it's the air around us, we call that the atmospheric pressure. And we measure that with a barometer. Uh, sorry about that, I made a mistake. All right, thumbs up people on your, hold on, let me check first. Yep, everybody see on the upper right of your screen, uh, tube and gray, and you see atmosphere pressure pushes down on mercury. Do you see that on your screen right now? Thumbs up, people. Uh-oh, you don't. Ah, you do. I see everybody coming through for me. Thank you. Now, this was the original barometer and in fact, up to a couple of years ago in labs, like a teaching lab at COD, we had this type that looked really, let's see if they have a, I'll show you, find a picture in a second. But what this is, is a barometer invented by the Italian scientist Torricelli. And what it does is you have liquid mercury, mercury is a liquid at room temperature. And this tube is originally evacuated, empty with a vacuum in it, nothing in it. You put it under a pool of mercury and the atmospheric pressure pushes down. Remember pressure force per unit area and it forces the mercury up the tube. And the distance from where the top of the pool is in this dish to where the mercury is in the tube is called the barometric pressure. So you measure something, a distance. If you measure it in the metric, you measure in millimeters of mercury, mm. If you're in the United States or England, you measure it in the inches. And that's why if you look at your local uh, weather report, let's do that. Everybody see Glen Allen on your screen now? The words, not the city. All right. Uh, my favorite place to get weather is the weather underground. And this is for COD, Glen Allen. If we scroll down, you'll see here, it says pressure 29.91 inches. Instead of millimeters of mercury, in the United States, we measure inches. Now in chemistry, we never use that, but obviously if you're looking at the weather in the United States, you do. Now, the barometer measures pressure. Now we have electronic devices with sensors and you don't need mercury, why? Mercury is a very hazardous compound, and they've tried to eliminate all the use of mercury in our daily life, which is a good thing, like in thermometers and also in barometers. Now, when you measure atmospheric pressure, the distance that mercury goes up the tube is called millimeters of mercury, because the original barometers were, you were measuring how high the mercury went. And I'm gonna go a minute or so more and then we'll take our break. And 
in honor of Tor Sully's discovery, one millimeter mercury is also called one Tor. It's his short name. You should know, I'll have this important information, but you should be familiar with one millimeter mercury equals one Tor. And with that, let's take a five minute break, come back at uh, 9.57 or thereabouts, in about five minutes, come back and I will continue. So I'm gonna go stretch.
All right, everybody. I think that was about five minutes. Everybody back? All right, let's continue where we left off. And we're talking about millimeters of uh, barometric pressure or atmospheric pressure. And you measure it in either millimeters of mercury or tor. One millimeter of mercury, just a definition, equals one tor. So therefore, I can ask the following. Remember, this is material for test number three, which is going to be coming up soon. In July, tests are about every Thursday now. So And the question is, how many tor is 583.5 millimeters of mercury? Well, what are you trying to find? Tor, what are you given? And the only thing we have to start with is this. And remember, and this will be an important information test three. And now, guess what? We can use our good buddy, our good friend, unit analysis. What are we trying to get to? Tor. And if we have a ratio to convert millimeters of mercury to tor, what do I do? I use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis. Whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath. We have tor. We have millimeters of mercury. Where do we get these numbers? Right here. One tor equals one millimeter of mercury. And you can do the math in this case. These are both exact numbers. So we start out with four significant figures. We'll end up with four significant figures. And that's how you do it. That's pretty straightforward. I don't think I have to do another example. And let's continue on. Now, there's an important other uh, pressure scale at sea level, which Chicago is essentially most of us are right at sea level. The atmospheric pressure is defined at, without a storm coming through, 760 millimeters of mercury. Because one millimeter of mercury equals 760, our one millimeter of mercury equal one millimeter tor at atmospheric pressure at sea level, 760 millimeters of mercury equals 760 tor. Now, there's a new unit, which is atmospheres, at, and it's abbreviated ATM, not the place where you take, get your money, but as abbreviation for atmosphere. And by definition, 760 millimeters of mercury equals one atmosphere. But since this is true, you also know this. And notice I have know this. In the past, I'd ask you to memorize this. But now I will be giving this to you an important information. Now, there are other units inches of mercury, which we don't use. As you saw in the uh, weather report, I think it was 29.92. We're right about one atmosphere. 
because by definition, 29.9 inches of mercury equals one atmosphere. Also, there's something called pounds per square inch is also abbreviated as PSI. And this is 14.7 PSI equal one atmosphere, which means if your tires are about 35 PSI like mine are on my SUV, you're a little over two atmospheres pressure. And that's what keeps the tire inflated. The pressure there is pushing out on the rubber because the pressure inside is greater than the pressure in the atmosphere and that keeps it inflated. Now, these other units we will never use in this class, but the important one is 760 Tor equals 760 millimeters of mercury equals one atmosphere. And that's the unit of pressure we use with gases. So let's look at the following. I promise I wouldn't write, so. And the question is how many atmospheres, that's what AT, M stands for is 583.1 tor. So what are we being asked to find? Atmospheres. What are we given? There's only one number I have to start with, so I'm going to start with that. If I had a ratio, it's time to use your good buddy, your good friend, your analysis, what units do I want my answer to be in? Atmospheres. And now I really will use my good buddy, my good friend, whatever units I want to go, go to, and my answer goes on top of that ratio, whatever units I want to get rid of go underneath. Oops, got ahead of myself. And where do I get this ratio? You know that 760 tor equals 760 millimeters of mercury equal one atmosphere. And because of that, for every one atmosphere, you have 760 tor. Now, all the numbers in this right here are exact numbers, which means this is an exact number. This is an exact number. And therefore, this has how many significant figures? Four. So my answer better have four significant figures. So if I take up my calculator, which I will, And I put in the numbers, which I am. My calculator gives me this number. There has some. And that's the number it gives me. I'm going to let you round this off to four significant figures. Time's up. If we look at this, keep to seven, keep to six, keep to seven, keep to two. Use this number to round off. Is that four or less? And the answer is yes. So I'm going to drop that and everything else. And to four significant figures, this is my answer. And that's how you do the conversion. And now I'm going to be nice and let you have some fun.
I'm going to help you on your way. What are you trying to find? Tor. What are you given? And don't forget, use your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. Go. If you don't have your calculator, just set it up. Remember on test two, the more work you show for problems where you have to calculate something, if you make a mistake, the more partial credit I can give you. And I'll remind you about that next week. All right, I'll give you another 15 seconds to finish up. All right, give you more than 15. How do you do this? Well, this is the only number we have to work with. So I'm gonna work with it. And if I could use a ratio to convert it to my answer, what units do I want my answer in? Tor. And now I'll use my good buddy, my good friend, unit analysis, Whatever I'm trying to get to, the units go on top. Whatever units I'm trying to get to, the units go underneath. So I want on top tour. I want underneath atmospheres. That's what ATM is. Where do I get these numbers? From here. 760 tour equal one atmosphere. So for every one atmosphere, I have 760 tor. These are exact numbers. If you notice here, I had a decimal point there. You can see it over here too. This is three significant figures. My answer should be three significant figures. And now I'm going to go to, before I go to my calculator, notice atmospheres is divided by atmospheres. That cancels out because anything divided by itself is one. Anybody have any nightmares seeing this being drawn in front of them? I hope not. But anyways, it's always good to remember that. And I'm left with tour, so I'm on the right track. And now I can pick up my calculator, which I am going to do.
and my calculator gives me the following number. And if you put this on a test, I'd take off one point because it should be three significant figures. And I'll let you round that off to three significant figures. And I'll give you five seconds, not six seconds, two times three. Time's up. I want three significant figures. Keep the four, keep the four, keep the two. Use the three to round off. Is that four or less? It is. So I drop that. And the correct answer is that. How, how, many, how many tor do you get? That's the answer, 4.42 times 10 to the third tor. And again, this will be given to you, but remember 760 millimeters of mercury equals one atmosphere also equals 760 tor. And I talked about the other pressure units. We've done, I have it here, but I did my own problems. And you might want to try these and ask, I'll, you know, you can try these on your own. And I see a question. Uh, Colton, that would be the same number, but not in scientific notation. If you were to write that in scientific notation, that'd be 4.4232 times 10 to the third, which is essentially what I got. So that's a good question. Thank you for asking that. All right. If you notice Boyle's Law, you know what that tells me? It's time to stop talking about lecture and it's lab time. And today's a fun lab and you can download the following lab from Blackboard. We're not gonna use Beyond Lab Z. I believe next Tuesday we'll use it again, but for now we won't. And what's today's lab? Well, let's find out. And today's lab is determining the empirical formula of magnesium oxide. Everybody see that on your screen? Thumbs up, people. Thank you. Now, what's this word empirical formula? I've used that. That's the formula of how many magnesium atoms and how many oxygen atoms are in magnesium oxide. Well, how do you do that? How did chemists determine that? Well, long ago, when chemists were trying to find the empirical formula, and this is mainly for inorganic compounds, they used various chemical reactions and the mole concept to do that. You learned about the mole concept. And this lab, you will determine the empirical formula for magnesium oxide, MgxOy you will determine what is X, what is Y in that formula. Now, please listen. X and Y are exact numbers always. You can't go and find half a mile, uh, atom of oxygen. Just like you're not going to go to the supermarket and ask, can I have half an egg? They look at you funny. You can't. Well, same thing. So X and Y are exact numbers. That means they're whole numbers, never fractions, never decimal. X and Y are whole numbers, exact number, never fractions, never decimal. Now, oxygen will react with magnesium to form magnesium oxide. To make it go faster, you heat it up with a Bunsen burner. If we were in the lab, I'd be telling you this. And the first reaction is magnesium plus oxygen makes magnesium oxide. And notice Dr. White didn't balance this and you don't need to for this lab. 
and didn't tell you what X and Y are, because that's what you're going to find out. Now, as I've mentioned many times, in the air you're breathing, we have nitrogen gas along with the oxygen gas. And guess what? When you're heating the magnesium for this reaction to react with the oxygen, magnesium can also react with nitrogen gas in reaction too, which you don't want. But good news to get rid of, and this is called the side reaction. This is our main reaction. And this we don't really want, but it's going to go on. Turns out for this chemistry, to eliminate the side reaction, you'll do reaction three. Any magnesium oxide at the end form, you put a little water in, and that will convert it to magnesium oxide, MgxOy, plus ammonia, which will come out as a gas. The magnesium oxide is a solid at room temperature. So in this lab, you will determine the empirical formula, magnesium oxide, which means you'll determine what X and Y are in equation one. And you'll use the knowledge that one mole of an element, and we're talking about elements, equals the atomic weight in grams of that element. And you know where to find the atomic weight of an element on the periodic table. Now, let's look at the following video. Let me get this queued up. Grammarly is your personal writing assistant. Time out for a commercial to get done. Let me make sure. Thumbs up, people. You see Chem 100 on your screen from YouTube. Thank you. Let me expand it. And let's get started. And this is what you'll be doing if you were doing the lab. That ribbon is magnesium that he just put in there, or she put in there. And see it in the crucible? And you would be doing this. Now, you're going to use a Bunsen burner. And notice you should always have your hair tied back. In our lab, it looks. Uh, you would be using, have gloves on. Now, you'll be heating the magnesium oxide. Every once in a while, you take the lid off to let oxygen in. Now, if you see a white flame like that, you put the lid on and let it sit for a little while, about 10, 15 seconds, and then pull it off. Now, turn that white smoke is magnesium, which you don't want escaping. That's why you covered it. You keep on doing that every once in a while until you no longer see that white flame. You cover it. Now he'll or she will take the cover off again. Notice raise the lid periodically. Now, everybody see inside there that white ash that looks like cigarette ashes? I hate to use that analogy, but it does. That's magnesium oxide. Now you're going to let it cool down. And now we're going to add the water to get rid of the magnesium nitrate, nitride. We never stir it. You don't have to. 
Now, if you notice there's some water in there, and that's why we don't stir it, you don't have to. You heat it up again to get rid of the water. You see that white ash in there? That's magnesium. I guess gray color ash. And now you'll weigh everything. And that will give you the weight of the crucible cover after it's cooled down. And you will need that number. And when you're done, you clean it. Now let's go back to something. Right now that inside that crucible where you, when they take it off, see how hot it is? That's at least a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. So this is a very important thing to do. Use the, uh, I call them uh, tweezers or not tweezers, whatever, forceps, that's the name to take the lid off and wait until this cools before you take it off. And even then use the forceps to make sure you don't burn yourself. Wait a second. Now I should point out years ago when I taught this lab at COD, Twice in all the times I've been teaching lab for many years, I've had two students have accents and both times they had accents because they didn't follow directions. One in Chem 1212 and where I said use a funnel and they didn't, they got an acid burn. I'm, this is not 1212, but when doing the magnesium oxide, I told students when you're picking up the uh, cover, if it falls out of your uh, forceps, Guess what? Don't try and catch it. Let it break. It's super hot. I had one student catch it. She had major burn on her hand from that cover. And her mother was a nurse. And we you know, sent the student to hospital to get it taken care of because it was a bad burn. And the mother called me and was quite upset. And I said, unfortunately, I told all students, I said a number of times, don't try and catch it. And the student did. And that's why she got burned. And when the mother talked to her daughter, she found out that's what I had said. And the daughter told her and also told me, I wasn't thinking what you said. And just instinctively, I went to catch it. Well, I can, after that, when we do that lab face to face, when their students are heating up the crucible and doing that with the Bunsen burner, about every two to three minutes, I will say, the cover falls, don't catch it. And since then, I've never had a problem. Thank you. Let's go to what you have to do. Now, normally, when we're doing a face-to-face, -face, anytime you do a measurement like that, you do it in duplicate. You do two of those, what we call runs. But since you're, I'm going to give you the data, I'm only going to have you do one. Now, here I just have, again, the procedure you just saw in the, uh, well, this should be a 10 or nine. Anyways, this is the procedure you would follow. And what you would do is initially, you weigh the empty crucible and cover, then we have already cut lengths of magnesium. So here's the weight, one of the magnesium with the crucible and the cover. And let me check something. You can't see it. All right, somebody should have got it. I can't see the layout. All right, thumbs up, people. Do you see data on your screen right now? Thank you. All right, here's the procedure. You don't have to read this, but in case you want to, this is what you've done face to face. And I actually give students that printout. And this also with two runs to help them out. Now, you would have weighed the weight of the crucible and cover empty, clean. Then the weight of the crucible cover and magnesium. 
And to get the weight of magnesium, which I call number three, you take one and subtract two from it. This minus this, and you'll get a weight of magnesium. Now, after you burn it and you put the water and heat it again, cool it down, you never put a hot object on a balance because the heat will throw your measurement off. You have the weight of the crucible, crucible cover and the magnesium oxide, that gray white solid you made. And you had from number two, the weight of the crucible and cover empty from your initial data. And if you take four minus two, you'll get five, which is the weight of the magnesium oxide. Now, calculations you have to do. How many oxygen, not O2, but oxygen atoms did you make or uh, attach to the magnesium? That's, I call number six, and that's number five minus number three, which is right here. Now, for the next two calculations, one mole of an element equals the atomic weight in grams divided by, uh, the weight in grams divided by the atomic weight of the element in grams. So for magnesium, you'd use equation A, and the weight of that element is number three. And for cal question number three, calculate the moles of oxygen atom in magnesium, you'd use again this equation A and the number right here in six. Now in two and three, you're gonna get two numbers. And what you do for number four, divide the moles of magnesium, your answer to calculation two right here, by the smaller number found in either two and three calculation and round it off to the nearest whole number. This is the X in magnesium oxide. For Y, you'll divide the moles of oxygen, answer to calculation number three, right up here, divided by the smaller, uh, number in either number two calculation or number three and round it off to the nearest whole number. And this is the Y in MGX OY. And over here, you should write MG and whatever the number you got for X, O and whatever number you got for Y. And by the way, in real life, this thing works really good. It's amazing how accurate it is. And then I have two questions for you. And with that, I'm done. I'm done for the day. And I, oh, it's sad. I'm done for the week, too. Because if I look at my computer, it says it's Thursday, even though it feels like Wednesday, because we had Monday off. My brain still hasn't caught up, gotten recalculated. And with that, I will say, gang gesund. Goodbye. Don't forget, Monday, I will do all the practice problems. There are three different sets for chapter five, part one. Do them, work on them. That will help you do good on test number two, which will be a week from today. With that, gang is on. Have a nice rest of the week and weekend and bye.